right, we're just waiting for everybody to join us. Happy Friday. And we're just going to give everybody a minute or two to click in here. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today with me. We are just sending out, and as soon as we are going, we're good. Let's see. Sometimes the internet, we are at the will of the internet. <laughs> Is the internet saying to me today, it's saying yes or no? Let's see. Okay, Air Crown, see your profile. All right, here we are. Happy Friday, everybody. Thanks for joining today. This is The Conservation Conversation, episode 26. And I'm very excited. Today's guest is filmmaker Carrie David. And for those of you that are just joining us, I'm your host, Eric Crown. For those that have been here before, it's nice to see you back with us today. Uh, we have kind of a unique show. What we do <clears throat> is we uh, have a way that you can type online, whether you're watching on Facebook or you're watching on um, it says, is it online? Okay, yes, while you're watching either side. So I seem to be having technical difficulties right now. All right, here we go. We're just going to give everybody a minute to get online with us and join us here. Hello, everybody in YouTube. Welcome. Thanks for joining today. This is the Conservation Conversation episode 26. And for those of you just joining us now on Facebook, I'm glad to see everybody. It is Friday. It is the Conservation Conversation episode 26. And I couldn't be more excited. Today's episode has one of my good friends and one of my true inspirations, filmmaker Carrie David. And we are going to talk about a topic we've talked a little bit before about poaching. Now, for those of you that are just joining for the first time, my name is Eric Crown. I'm your host. And what we do is we have it so that you can make comments throughout the entire show. And um, well, we are just having issues with our internet today. Goodness, goodness, goodness. Oh my gosh. I can't believe we're having this problem right now. Let's see. Let's see if it let's see if it fixes itself. Why does it have to happen today? Uh, why is it happening today? Why me? Let's see. Maybe we might we might start now. Let's see what happens. I am sorry, everybody. We are having an issue, and I am unable to connect online right now. This is crazy. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I don't know what's going on. Hello, everybody. Okay, you can see me on Facebook. Hey, hey, there we go. All right, sorry about that delay. Welcome to the Conservation Conversation, episode 26. Uh, I don't know if you caught what I was talking about before, but what we were just saying is that we are um, here doing, let's see, oh, I'm seeing a black screen. If, there we go. If any of my friends are out there, please go ahead and type on and let me know if you're able to see me or if you're just hearing my voice. Uh, I'm very worried. We're going to have some technical difficulties today, and we may have to. All right. Hello, Andrea. Hello, Coralie. Hello. I see that you're here. With... Um, so, yes, we are having a bit of an issue. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Well, my friends. Hey, Scott. Thanks for joining. I seem to be having some technical difficulties right now, everybody. So, I, there we go, if any of my friends, all right, so I see we've got a little bit, okay, it's all black screen still, this is crazy, so let's just see if we can go to here, hey, did we, did we see anything now, nope, we're still getting all black screen, okay, so, um, shoot, all right, my friends, well, I don't know, this is probably not going to play either. Okay, well, I hate to do this, everybody. We are just hearing, and you know what? This is such an exciting show. I think what we should do 
is try to rearrange this show with Carrie and see if we can bring it to you um, possibly over the weekend or possibly over another day. I need to fix some technical issues. As you know, here we are live <laughs> and this does tend to happen sometimes. So I just wanted to say to everybody that um, I am, I see you, Janet Dell sees me, you're up. Oh my gosh, I cannot actually see myself. How interesting is that? I'm happy with this. Okay, everybody. So here we are. Okay, well, there we are. Let's do this. <laughs> so, okay, uh, everybody, I'm glad to hear you can see me. I'm glad you're here with me today. Uh, let's just start from the beginning. This is episode 26 of the Conservation Conversation with a very exciting guest, Carrie David, who's a conservationist filmmaker, and she does more than just that. And we're going to talk today about ways that you can get involved in saving the world in, in every capacity, because everybody has something that we can offer. Super excited for today. Uh, anyway, we're going to go ahead and start the opening. Uh, if you already watched it, uh, we're going to go ahead and pop it back in again. And then uh, so we're going to come back and start working on the show. All right. Welcome back, everybody. So here we are. Uh, and it's great to see everybody with us today. Um, you know, I always love this opportunity to get to be with everybody because we really this is, you know, like a very uh, big family. This is a worldwide family that we have here. So it's very, very exciting. Again, if you have not joined the episode before, in just a second here, you're going to have the ability to pop up your um, to pop up your chat. And uh, you just can go through Facebook or YouTube and enter your chat and it'll pop up on the screen here in just a few minutes. So today's very exciting. We're going to have Carrie with us in about 10 or 15 minutes and we are going to start talking about, um, <clears throat> here we go. Hopefully everybody can see me okay now. We're going to start talking about her film, Breaking Their Silence. So what we want to do though is uh, start off today as we always start off with a quote. So today's quote is by Dr. Jane Goodall, of course, always one of my absolute favorites, and this is an important one for today. It says, one individual cannot possibly make a difference alone. It's individual efforts, collectively, that makes a noticeable difference, all the difference in the world. And that is a very important part of my guest today, of Carrie's work, um, because what she does is filmmaking, which brings light to topics around the world that we can all then start to talk about because education is one of the biggest keys to reaching out and changing the world around us. And one of the topics today, and you know, the, the topic of the film, her film, Are the Women on the is uh, an amazing story, but Carrie herself has breaking, broken many um, barriers by, as she says, letting us see poaching war through the female lens. And that's on every level. And one thing I wanted to talk about today was um, women in the conservation movement. It's, it's you know, there, there's a lot more visibility these days, but very often um, women's contributions tend to be overlooked in conservation. Yet when I've traveled around the world, the most conservationists I've ever met were women and usually the most devoted ones as well. You know, there tends to be this um, sort of fantasized version of people going out and, and you know, it's an action adventure film um, and, you know, it's a, it's a macho thing. We're going to go stop the poachers and this and that. But in reality, women are the key to the conservation move, movement. And that's one of the things that Carrie's film illustrates, but it's also one thing that I wanted to illustrate about Carrie because she's adding a new voice to the conversation that has not been there before and that we really have needed. So um, I wanted to, uh, to just bring that up. <clears throat> so what we wanted to talk about today is, well, as we talk about actually, as we talk about the, um, the power of women to make a change in the world, it actually goes back to the Greek times. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar. There is a Greek play called Lysistrata. Now, Lysistrata is a very different example, um, <clears throat> but it's an example where women actually stop the entire war. And if you haven't read the play, I'm not going to give it away. Just go read it. It's amazing. But women realize if they if they come together, band together, they can force men 
to stop this kind of nonsense. And so, you know, what we have here is a more uh, intellectual approach, a more approach that comes from the heart, you know? And so what we see is we see everybody, <clears throat> you know, using that. Now, back, back in that day, women's visibility was mostly through sexuality. That was the Greek times. But throughout the course of history, women have always been central in in roles. For example, in Native American roles, most communities revolved around women running them, running the, um, you know, the stock, running how the town ran, running the levels of, of all the different grains and, and knowing what was happening with the agriculture and basically being in charge of, of the majority of things, you know. And the reason that I also bring this up is that we have Earth Day coming up on 420. And Earth Day is, we say Mother Earth. So, you know, there there's a feminine spirit that runs throughout the Mother Earth and that runs throughout the conservation movement. And I'm really excited today, like I said, to bring to bring Carrie into this. I just wanted to say real hi, uh, real hi, uh, real quickly, I wanted to say hi to everybody. I hope everybody can see me. I'm not able to see myself on screen, so it might just be my own personal internet. But I just wanted to say, hey, John, thank you for joining us today. Michelle, I'm really glad that you're on with us. Barbara, it's always nice to see you here today. Uh, and Barbara, you're gonna really uh, love Carrie and, and her work and getting to talk to her as well. I'm very excited. Hey, Carrie, I see you're watching also. <laughs> um, off to a little bit of a rough tech start here, but that's how things are. You know, when you're live, you gotta roll with it. Um, and then Camille, thank you for joining. It's really nice to see you here on the show with us today. It's so exciting uh, to see a lot of these names that are so familiar. And Holly, hey, Holly, it's my cousin there joining us today, very excited, Cody. And uh, hello, um, thank you. Thank you very much, WLC Wildlife Campus, um, one of the main the main nonprofits that really because it was a really fascinating interview, and we learned quite a bit. And today it's another amazing aspect because from Carrie we're going to learn about another aspects of the of the poaching war and the human toll on the poaching war, and you know a, a lot of other aspects of how we're all very connected to it. Hey, Javier is watching. Hup. Hello, Mr. Jared. Um, let's see. Sherry, thank you for joining. Jose, I appreciate you being here. Jose and Raphael. Um, Coralie, I'm glad you're here. Javier said, hup. Good, good. So everybody's here. This is a really great turnout today. Like I said, I'm very excited. Carrie is not only a great filmmaker, but a very inspirational person because she uses her work to promote the, the project, to promote the concept of the film. When you see Carrie talking in interviews, she'll spend every moment that she has in an interview. And you've got to go to her website. It's incredible. And see the press that she's already done. She's incredibly well-spoken and really helps conservation come to a new forefront and help people see it in a brand new fashion that they hadn't seen it before. And I love the way that she does that. When she's out in her interviews, it's she, she tends to over, not even really talk about so much her experience. And I'm hoping that she'll talk to us a little bit today about that because it's quite incredible because Carrie is like myself, you know, a filmmaker that entered conservation, not a conservationist necessarily that entered filmmaking. So we had to kind of get up to speed a little bit and know what it's like to get out there in the field with 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 that and to get into these topics. And it's it takes a little bit of a learning curve. So, you know, the idea is we all have something we can offer. And that's what we want to talk about today. We're going to talk about the human toll that totally surrounds poaching. And that starts with from the poachers all the way to the final market which many people will be surprised where those final markets are. So real fast, before we bring Carrie on, we're going to bring Carrie on in about five minutes from now. But what I wanted to do is just illustrate a little bit of the issues that we do face here in a conservation. Um, you know, again, I didn't want people to think that poaching is something that just happens in one part of the world and doesn't affect the rest of us. With coronavirus, we have learned, you know, the animal trade that's international, that's illegal, can affect all of us. And the reason that I bring this up is because one of the main issues is bushmeat. Bushmeat is a meat that basically comes from any animal that they can find while they're out in the wild. Uh, when I was in Peru, I saw tons of bushmeat. You just see legs and you can't really even tell what is going on there. So it's a very, um, it's a very complicated issue because bushmeat is, it's hard to track, it's hard to trace, and it's hard for people to keep up with and know exactly what's happening. Um, now, the thing is, you know, when we talk about bushmeat, we have to remember that AIDS comes from bushmeat, uh, crossed into humans from chimpanzees in the 20s. 
Um, and it comes back again to the African hunters and directly from that. Now, bushmeat, over 180,000 pounds of it is smuggled into the U.S. every year. Um, we currently have lost our country of origin labeling laws. Um, so once the meat is smuggled in, it can actually be processed in America and then put back out on the shelves and considered a product of America. So there's a lot of sneaky ways that they are bringing in bushmeat into our country. So uh, bushmeat is a major thing. And I bring this up right now because, you know, we know that we can get diseases from animals and how we treat animals. And we have to remember poaching, just like all other animal abuse and animal neglect um, and animal agriculture affects the entire world. So we know that now, like I said, through coronavirus, we're all very conscious of this. And we have to remember that poaching is not something that just happens in Africa and someone else is taking care of it. And that's what that is. You know, we have to do a little bit more than that. And we have to understand we're actually one of the biggest markets. You know, um, it's actually legal inside of the United States to bring in um, rhino horn, elephant tusk, ivory. You'd be shocked at how open it is. We're going to talk with Carrie a little bit more about that. But I just wanted to bring up the fact that poaching itself is a big, big industry. It's over a $20 billion a year industry, and it's rapidly growing. So one of the big prizes is rhino horn. Now, rhino horn is just made from keratin, which is just a protein that's, you know, your fingernails are rhino horn, basically. Now, in Chinese medicine, um, that supposedly to help out with everything from cancer to gout to everything else, they take the rhino horn, and they turn it into a powder and sell it through Chinese medicine. And in 2017, China said, you know what, we're going to stop the, temporarily we're going to stop the import of ivory until we can assess what's happening with the worldwide populations. Unfortunately, in 2018, tiger bones, which are um, sent and then boiled down into what's called tiger cake, which is the jelly from the bones, and rhino horn were legalized for use in Chinese medicine in China in 2018, which means that the issues that everybody that works on anti-poaching faces will have these same issues that they're going to have to now deal with at an even larger scale. Because even though supposedly this is going to be a regulated and monitored thing, we know that it's not. So we know that we're going to end up with a lot more um, problems that come out of this, this thing that they're doing, which is allowing this to come back in. And again, it's just keratin. It is not um, any form of magical thing. I believe Rhino Hornet even said maybe they could, you could tell somebody was lying if you drank a cup of it. I mean, it's just crazy, some of the things. And, you know, not to dispel homeopathy, but Chinese medicine is a lot of um, sort of guesswork, and none of it has any social proven, scientific proven um, results. So we are destroying animals, and we are putting them into critically endangered areas by trying to continue with this Chinese medicine. Now, when we talk about hunting, the point is, is that we are allowed to bring it into the United States through trophy hunting. How hard is it to go kill a rhino or an elephant? It's very easy. You can actually order it online. And, um, you know, now a lot of people may argue that there's, there's a lot of benefit in this trophy hunting, but it is a loophole that our country allows trophy hunters to continue to bring in fresh rhino horn and fresh ivory. And this is the thing that we really feel needs to be curtailed. So it's a very important topic. It's something that affects us all from the people living in the villages where they are poaching all the way out to where we are today. Because us here in the United States, as long as it's still legal, um, and we're going to talk to Carrie, it's, you'd be shocked at how big of an industry it actually is out here in the United States. And all of us need to get our game up and we need to find ways to prevent this because this is the only way we're going to stop things in the future. Now, Carrie's from, let's go back to that again, because one more time, we're going to go through the poaching war through the female lens and we are going to understand a very different perspective on it. But uh, incredible film. What I want to do right now is just show everybody the trailer real fast and then we're going to come back and talk to Carrie live. So the film is about women on the front line of the poaching war. I started to research the crisis that is the human animal wildlife crisis and the poaching crisis. And the more I researched it, the worse the information got. 
but I started slowly to hear about some incredible women in this space who were doing remarkable things and there's a lens through which this crisis has not been explored. And that's the female lens. We can be persuasive, we can use our instincts. I also work with the animals with instincts. That sixth sense is the most amazing thing that God gave women. I think that is the disconnection that we see with nature. We need to be active in conservation and we need to go up and look at it from all kinds of different angles. Find a way to work together. Whenever we see an animal in our community, like they chase it, they kill it. I told the, 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 my community that this is nature. We need them, they need us. Let us protect everything. As women, we need to have a, to have a voice to our men, not to, to kill nature because our future generation needs these animals. There's an amazing story here because each of these women, I'm and I want to support them and I hope that through this film that people can research their organizations and volunteer for them, fund them, whatever's necessary to prevent us losing these incredible species to extinction which could happen in as soon as five years because that is how extreme it is and I'm getting that the time is now. We need to stand together and say, but I want to understand what's going on. The solution is a global solution of saving the species for eternity. You can be part of it. Most people don't act because they don't know. Most people don't act because they don't know. Because they don't know. Because they don't know. Because they don't know. You know now. You know now. Now you know. Now you know. Now you know. You know now. So what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What will you do about it? What are you going to do? Most people don't act because they don't know. But you know now. So what are you going to do? Just my luck. Right? <laughs> so here we go. We are now back with Carrie. Hey, Carrie, thanks for joining us on the show today. It's, it's, it's showing that it has its poor connection. Ah, you know what, Perfect everybody, video. we are having the worst time today with our connections. I hate to do this, but I'm very concerned, Carrie, that we're not going to be able to have the kind of conversation we need to have with this signal issue. Um, I don't know if you're able to hear me now. If, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if we might be able to maybe talk on another day when this we can get this kind of worked out a little bit. I'm so sorry to everybody. We had we, we tested it and everything was working fine. OK, <laughs> nice. OK. And then, uh, of course, the moment we start. OK, so here we go, Carrie. So thanks for coming in. I, we wanted to talk about breaking their silence first. If I you could just kind of tell me <laughs> how, you know, um, how you got involved and what was it about the story that you heard that inspired you to take a camera out there? Um, okay, so I've always been an advocate and so I can't say that I didn't know about the situation, but the thing that made me from anger to action is actually going to a fundraiser at an elephant fundraiser downtown in Los Angeles and I found out exactly how dire the situation was for our wildlife and so 
I was traumatized, truly traumatized by it when I came home and I thought, I can't say that I'm an advocate for animals and do nothing about it because what I saw that night, I could never forget, can pretend I hadn't seen it. And I didn't know what I could bring to it. I didn't know what I could do because I'm not, I'm not an, an, you know, an animal specialist in any way. I wasn't a wildlife conservationist, but I was somebody passionate about wildlife and about animals. And I thought, well, okay, I'm a filmmaker. How can I bring that to it? And then from there, I had the idea to go to Africa on a wing and a prayer, basically, trusting in the process that when I got there, it would all unfold. I did obviously a little bit of prep work prior, and I, ha I hired an amazing team. And I thought I would tell this story through the female lens because I hadn't heard it through the female lens. And I was curious to how women were helping and in what ways they were helping that was different from men. I knew a lot of men in the space and God bless them. We need them. They're doing a phenomenal job. In fact, we met through Pete Bethune and there's, right. there's few better, right? <laughs> That's true. Very true. So, so I took a very, I knew uh, I was my executive producer, uh, Keith Watson was just phenomenal because he basically rallied 13 of his a matter of weeks. I had the budget that I put together and said, I don't know that we can do it on this small of a budget. But it's certainly if we have a skeleton crew and everyone knows they're all going to be wearing a multitude of hats, you know, we have a good chance of, of really sort of run and gunning. <clears throat> and I wasn't trying to make a Nat Geo film because they do it brilliantly. Why would I want to try to do that? I wanted to make a film that people like me, just lay people who knew nothing about this poaching and the wildlife trafficking could learn as I learned with my team and let them in Africa tell us what's going on. I don't want to have me go over there and come back and say, oh, well, this is what's going on, because I didn't know. And so that was the impetus of the project. And I had a core group of incredible filmmakers working with me. You know, I had quite a few as it all unfolded, but my core team that, that stayed with me the whole time were just phenomenal. And I couldn't have done it without them. That, that, you know, and that, that's incredible. I love the approach that you wanted to go down, take the camera down and show everybody firsthand, because I think that that's one of the keys uh, where, you know, we, we kind of talked about oh, <laughs> uh, everybody, you know, is able to everybody is able Sorry, to you're make good. you're back. OK, good. There we go. Um, yeah. Everybody is able to make an impact in a different way. And so, you know, your way was to go down and to let people see firsthand what was happening when you were down what was one of sort of the biggest shocks that you found or you one of the biggest misconceptions that you went in there with one of the biggest shocks um how prevalent it was, mm. you know, people understood the whole topic. I, in, you know, invasive over there, everyone knows about rhino poaching. Everybody knows mm. that uh, the wildlife are being driven out of their lands. Like they literally have nowhere else to go. This coronavirus that's come up uh, and the SARS virus and the MERS virus, they all came from animals and wildlife that really we should never have interacted with. Because like you had said earlier on Facebook, the bushmeat is prepack it's packaged and then shipped to the US. And we have no idea. We think it's beef from America. It's bushmeat from Africa. And it could be a monkey. It could be any. We have no idea. And that's how disease travels, right? That's how it comes to us. So it, it's talk about a timely movie. If it was it was not my intention to go there and explain how a pangolin ends up in a wet market in Vietnam. But that's what the film does. It will show you exactly how a pangolin ends up in the wet market in Vietnam. And we speak with two separate nonprofits in Vietnam, Hong Huang and Trang Nguyen. Both have, I think, such spirit because they're in a communist country where if they speak out about their government and the government's corruption and lapse laws and easy borders for all this wildlife to be trafficked through, they can go to jail. And they have had peers that are in jail and been given wow. women who have been given 10 year sentences just for speaking out about the government on, you know, on wildlife. And you can research a woman called Mother Mushroom. She's a perfect case, although I do believe they let her out early, but she had hard labor. So they have 
to talk about this they're trying to implement in their country they're trying to explain why we need wildlife and why what we're doing isn't working and it has been scientifically unproven that rhino horn can help the oh tiger bones do anything is exactly as you said earlier but you know they're trying to change a culture yeah. an entire culture that believes that if you use wildlife products they they are more potent so you can't even like a lot of one of the problems in Vietnam, well, you know this, one of the problems in Asia is that they keep bears locked in cages where the bear cannot move around and they stab needles into the bear to extract the bear bile because they think the bear bile is medicinal. It is it's so inhumane. Uh, there's not even any words to express it. So they're up against trying to change a culture that believes that this will cure cancer. Um, I, I guess what I'd love to share, I've, I've talked a lot about the film, so I wanted to mm -hmm. sort of share things I don't talk about a lot along the journey. Fantastic. And one of them was that, you know, in Asia, so say a grandmother gets cancer, the whole family will oftentimes sell their homes to get the money to, to buy the rhino horn that mm. is, they've been told will cure that cancer. So not only does the grandmother die, but rhino horn doesn't cure cancer, they now have lost their home and have to move in with their families. So I wanted to put a human spin on this problem. It, it's too easy to alienate Asia because yeah. what they believe is so contrary to what we believe. So I thought if, we, if I could invite people into this space, much like what you do, much like what I did, was to just meet people where they were and try to understand and then maybe we could all come up with solutions that are less aggressive than kill everything and eat everything yes. you know which <laughs> no china seems to do and without any reservation you know you know that that's an amazing human toll that nobody really talks about. That these people have to sell their fit their houses. You know, I mean, the rhino horn. Could you give us an idea? Say how much a rhino horn would go for if they were going to go buy this. Um, you know, to to try to help their relative. So it all depends on the size and weight of the rhino horn, but I'll give you an idea. That the only thing on planet Earth more expensive than rhino horn is weapon-grade plutonium. Wow. Pound for pound. Wow. That's that's really incredible. <clears throat> I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't aware of that. That that's insane. Yeah. That is way. I'm gonna too try valuable. taking my ears out. See if that helps. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know now. <clears throat> so you know we, we talked about the human toll that the sometimes even the people in the markets have. You know, I what I wanted to ask about too is when you were there, what kind of human toll did you find inside of the actual poachers villages themselves or the um you know the poachers themselves it, you know what what sort of experience and what sort of human toll why why are they out there doing this and how is it possible do you think that we can sort of help change all that Okay, so I'm, I'm not here to say I have the solution to all this because I don't, nobody does. But I can tell you that on the journey for breaking their silence, we went, I knew I had to meet a poacher and I, it was the thing I was most dreading about the entire trip, thinking if I'm going to do a fair and balanced review of this or telling of this story, then I'm going to have to meet one. So I went to Rwanda and there was an amazing man there called Edwin Subaru, who is Rwandan, went to law school, was going to be a lawyer. He learned about the poaching in Rwanda, his home country, and he decided he was just going to do something about it. No no one in his family ever had before. Don't know where that came from. He doesn't know where it came from, the desire to help his wildlife. So he went to the mountain, he went to volcanoes in Rwanda, and he, and it's sort of a parable because you want to do what he did, which was he went and lived with the poachers who all lived in the forest, they didn't have homes, they literally lived in the forest self-admittedly that they didn't bathe, they were dirty, they were smelly, they were almost aliens compared to other Rwandans. And their entire life was poaching. Wow. And so he lived with them for a year and he gained their trust. And after a year, all he had was $1,500 to his name. He, he, he called a meeting of all the tribes. He said, lay down your weapons and come to this communal meeting. And 
he said to them, I want you to not poach. You know me now. You know my intentions. I've lived with you for a year. My intentions are good. Let's find another way. And here's all the money I have in the world. How can we best use that? So it's, it's a, cutting a very, very long story short, they did they did work with him and now they had created a reformed poachers village and when you go to that village they take you around all of their huts in this acreage and they tell the story of rwanda they tell the story of when they were poachers and what they do now is they build, they tell stories about their culture they build um homes for you to go and stay in and their crafts you can buy them so it's far more tourism now and the they use the wildlife to to um to bring the tourists in and they work together with the wildlife and they now realize how important it is to work with wildlife and not kill it because they are more wealthy now not poaching they own homes they own land they have communities they have tribal meetings where they all decide what's best for the tribe and now that has been franchised over 13 different regions in Rwanda. And it's so successful that pe even people who were not poachers try to get in to be a part of the community. So that's a perfect success model. That's, that's how it works, when it works. And similarly in Botswana, before the new president, when Ian Karma was the president, Ian had a, uh, a system whereby they bring the tourists in and work together with the animals and protect the animals and it worked it worked well for 15 years mm. and the new guy comes in and says yeah going to change all that lifting the ban off element uh, elephants and and 100 elephants were slaughtered that first month Jeez. so we we yeah yeah we can we can do it it's just this money thing coming in right this greed everything has a dollar bill on it so an elephant will go for $39,000 in Botswana, one elephant, if you want to shoot it, it'll cost you $39,000. Big Life did a survey that says over the life of an elephant through tourism, that one elephant. I so in the long run, it is not more cost effective to kill the elephant because because it would have so much more value if they let the elephant live and just focused on bringing in tourism wow you know wow that that's incredible and you know that that's the that's the best story i have ever heard i love that that they found a sustainable way to make ecotourism the winner in the whole thing you know that the the animals are worth more alive than dead um you know i was reading that it was about a 20 billion dollar industry poaching but um tourism and i think ecotourism in africa was somewhere around over 200 um billion dollar industry so they actually have so much in throughout the whole continent um that you know i think it would it's to hear that story is incredible and it gives us because there are sustainable models how to live and this is what a lot of people are not are not uh, understanding and it's also important what you were talking about the fact that these people you know this is all yes. they have and and they are starving they are hurting they are doing this um you know because of money so in a lot of ways we have to find ways to help them with poverty and we have to try to help the people in order to help yeah. the animals and like we were talking about we have to help the animals to help the people it's a very you know uh in integrated relationship and uh, i love that that model takes place you know in the, in the value of the animal's life as opposed to the value of their hide which you know is is unfortunately still so common you know we saw that a lot in um south america when i was down there with pete there were entire yeah. networks of huts that were set up <clears throat> and the poachers all kind of knew each other and everybody moves around and they use these pre-established houses and camping areas in order to you know, to, to kind of work together. So it's crazy because they really work together in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, a lot of the anti-poaching units are now starting to really bring all their intelligence and work together. Um, and for everybody that has not seen the documentary yet uh, or hasn't even watched the trailer yet, can you just tell us a little bit about the, uh, the anti-poaching unit that you spend time with? Um, so, okay, that's, that's two stories. So in the okay. film, what I focused on were the women, uh, who are all in very different 
arenas all within for fighting on the front lines. So we spent time with a prosecutor and she's 100% success rate with um, convicting rhino poachers. And I spent time with game rangers uh, out in the in the field. No anti-poaching units on that on, in the film. I was invited by Nambiti Private Game Reserve. Clark Smith is a dear friend out there and he runs it. And he invited myself and my friend Autumn Burke, who's a congresswoman. Uh, we went out there and after two days of being with them, they invited us to go out on a walking tour with their anti-poaching units, like the ones that actually patrolled uh, Nambiti. And the day prior, I had, we had been charged by a bull elephant. And it was called a mock charge. But let me tell you, when you're sitting in a Jeep and an elephant charges at you, mock or not, it is terrifying. You know, it's exciting wow. and exhilarating, but that's a whole wow. lot of beasts coming at you. Um, a pride of male lions came up and around the, the Jeep. And I didn't never realized how huge lions are. They're not small. They're, they're <laughs> enormous. And we were in a Jeep, so they look at they think that you're like one big beast and you're safe, right? But you get out the Jeep and it's a whole different story. <laughs> so when they put it to us, they said, Hey, you guys showed showed a lot of courage today. We would love to invite you to go walking with the our actual anti poaching unit. So we said, Sure. Well at four four AM I woke up and I thought I'm going to kill everybody because I'm going to be terrified and run off. I'm going to be that like <laughs> wild card. So I met with the head ranger at like 3.30 in the morning. And I just said to him, um, I'm so sorry. I said, I don't think I should go because I think I'd be really terrified if we, if we bump into a lion or an elephant on foot. And then he said, well, are you more afraid of the elephants or of the lions? And I really hadn't thought about it. And I said, well, I guess, I guess the lions. And he goes, okay, so we'll avoid the lions. Like, <laughs> holy joking. So we go out on this, this, patrol which was so eye-opening because they they walk 22 acres every day right and, 20, 20, and it's up mountains down mountains we were, we were tracking these two black rhino and you go you keep doubling where you were and then you come up again and i looked at their boots we had great boots like we obviously you know you pay money because you know you're going to your feet and we looked at their boots and they were in tatters mm -hmm. So when we came back, it was the most exhilarating thing. That was our anti-poaching unit. And through Over and Above Africa, which is that nonprofit I started, you know, because I was learning about it through the film, with my friend Jennifer Fister, she's our uh, executive director. And we raised money and we called it, it was our very first raise. And it was Boots for Rangers. And nice. so we came back and within, I think, three weeks, we, we'd raised $5,000 and we got all of these boots for the entire anti-poaching unit and then some. And so they now have boots forever, which is, you know, that's, that's yeah. how I see that the, the West can help. Mm. It's like, you know, that's something they could never afford for themselves. But it's so easy to come back here and just raise some money and... And do that for them and it's it's a loving gesture it's not patronizing it's not it's not charity it's just a loving gesture and they were more thrilled that someone on the other side of the world cared about them and the boots were secondary oh, that's know? that's a beautiful that's a beautiful story and i love that you know that's exactly it that we can still find ways to help you know because that's one thing we want really wanted to talk about is solutions i mean so often in conservation people feel <laughs> yeah helpless they feel overwhelmed and especially when it comes to poaching topics people think it's something over there it's something that they can't necessarily always jump in on but you know i know that you and i share a philosophy that everybody has a very important role to play whether it's your revolution through your routine the choices you make on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and what you choose and what you buy you know, if you're going to an auction house, mm -hmm. make sure not to buy something out of rhino horn or out of ivory. Make sure to change the markets around us. Um, but, you know, there's other ways as well that we that we can get involved. So I wanted to ask you, you know, the best ways that people can um, can get involved in this topic and, you know, help out. Uh, it's a great question because uh, so I was asked to give a TEDx talk, which if any if anyone who knows me knows that that is the most terrifying thing in the world, mm -hmm. public speaking. It, it, so I immediately wanted to say no, but it was so far off. I thought I'll say yes, I'll say no later, and then suddenly it was here and I had to do it. And I thought, you know, now I have been able to digest the film. The film has been winning all these film festivals. I thought, what is what is it that I really want to share with people about what I took away mm -hmm. from that? And it was about accountability. It was just that each one of us has a unique skill. 
So for me, I'm a filmmaker and I was able to go and make a film. That's not everybody's life and I understand that. And I think that people feel like to really make uh, an impact in conservation, you have to give up your job and then spend six months. But like your quote at the beginning, what Jane said, about it's just each of us doing one thing. So for instance, if you're really good at web designing or if you're learning it and want to help out a nonprofit here, most nonprofits that I know need help in the administration because we don't want to spend our money on our admin. We want to give all of our money to Africa where it's needed. And so we sort of scramble, I say we collectively, um, with the admin side of it. So if you're an accountant, offer to do like, you know, a, a couple of hours of accounting for a nonprofit that you believe in. Offer to do, um, um, try to get more members for some of the nonprofits that you believe in. Like there's so many small ways that you can actually be super effective because one small nonprofit cannot do everything effectively. We find ourselves sort of just doing everything we can as we, as we move along. But if people were to say, hey, I'd like to try to get you more members, how can I help? Or, hey, I'm really good at graphic design, can I design a t-shirt for you? Or, hey, I'm really good at merchandising online, let me help you work your merchandising uh, link out. You know what I mean? It's like these are the ways that are small to the person who's offering the services and massive to the nonprofit who can then really focus on getting the money to where it's needed. But beautifully said, beautifully said. And, you know, people always ask me, how did you start out with this? What did you do? And that's exactly it. Once I decided that I wanted to help in conservation, do anything I could do to help, I just started <laughs> volunteering. You know, I said, hey, I'll, let me let me edit this for you or let me try to shoot this day for you or let me come along and do what I can do. Um, you know, so it is. It's, it's, fan, it's a fantastic way to get to meet everybody, get to jump in, see how things work. And, you know, it's and, it, and there's never a shortage. There's never a shortage of problems <laughs> for, for us to be working on. And, you know, nonprofits especially run on fumes. So every time somebody can help out. Uh, now, for Carrie's nonprofit, you can actually go to Breaking Their Silence <laughs> no. and you can go to her. Um, you can go to the film website. And from there, you can click on how to help and you can go check out the other nonprofits there, because I think it's important to. And just, you know, another thing I wanted to talk to you about is um, that's another way that there's a new sort of hybrid of documentary filmmaking that's going on where we're going in, we're going into new communities, we're taking cameras into new places, but then we're finding ways to make those movies become uh, acts of good for the communities that we're in, you know. Um, so I just think it's really beautiful that your film has also not only brought attention to the topic, but has been able to actually, you know, help fundraise and do very practical things like, you know, mm -hmm. um, talk about, you know, uh, it's fantastic. And every little thing down there helps those guys. And I know that they have a very difficult, they have a difficult time putting together, you know, the money to keep the, everything running. So, you know, they're running on fumes too. And so everything we can do to help them is, is a huge help. So I encourage that. Now, Carrie, the, the other thing that I did want to talk about to you today, which I think is fascinating, um, you know, I think a lot of times also in conservation, people also feel it's kind of like you said, there's this. Well, can I break something exclusively on your Oh, podcast? I would love that. Yes, please. We have a, we have a delay. Okay, no problem. Sorry, tell me. I'll do that afterwards. Continue with your question. Continue oh, with your no, question. No worries. Here we go. What I was saying is, um, you know, it just, uh, well, it's actually, you know, it, it's perfect because everybody that can support the film now knows also that that money will, part of it always goes back to help. And I think that that's a new model for filmmaking. And it's something that's very unique. And it's something that I love that you're doing. And I feel like a lot of that also comes from, um, because it comes through the female lens. And one thing I wanted to ask you about, in conservation, there tends to be this mythology because of discovery that it's kind of like, you know, you got to go on a ship for nine months or you got to go to battle and you have to be macho and do all this stuff. Um, and it tends to be an imagery very male dominated through the television programs. Now we're breaking away from that because we're getting more and more films online and things are changing. So I think your film in itself is innovative because it brings the female perspective, female story of a story we all know 
through a brand new way for us to see it. And what I wanted to ask you about is, you know, for me, I mean, my travels, I have always met the majority mm-hmm. of the conservationists that are really out there that have the passion are women. And they tend to be slightly overlooked, I think, in um, when we talk about it in broad strokes. Have you found that to be the case or has that been, you know, how, how do you see the representation um, in conservation? I'm sorry, you just sounded really drunk all together. What, what did you say? Here we oh, go, no okay. problem. Yeah, no worries. Um, I know this, um, uh, you know, this whole um, delay is causing a little bit of an issue. What I was saying is with, uh, <laughs> so, okay, with women in representation in conservation, you know, in conservation and television, it tends to be very male dominated. It's like, whale wars or something wars or there's always a battle and it's always men and it's a lot of you know sort of macho sort of a a sacrifice and those guys are out there and they are critical um i had the privilege to go work with one of those guys for a while and they're they're incredible um you know and they're just devoted and wired to be in the field but there's also when i was traveling i found that the majority of people that were very passionate and the majority of conservationists in general that i met were women so i was wondering if you felt that you know there's um sort of a how that how do you feel about representation in the conservation movement for women and now that we have these films do you think it's it's changing and expanding a bit I do, I do, I really do. Uh, one of the women in my film, Petronel Petru Never, she has Care for Wild, uh, which focuses on rhinos. She'll, she'll take in any orphan from a poaching incident, but she, she focuses primarily on rhinos. She has an incredible uh, volunteering uh, program at Care for Wild, and she brings people in from all over the world, a lot of her. And when I asked her about obviously they need the help. But I said, is there a bigger plan to it? And she said, absolutely, because they come from all of these different countries. They'll come to me, they learn exactly what the problem is, and they'll go back to their countries and then impart that information. And so awareness is key to ending all this slaughter and barbaric behavior towards this wildlife. It's funny, as you were talking about this, the men versus women conversation, both are crucial to this. Yeah right? We've we, we got to have them both, but we come at it differently. Men, much like the males in the animal kingdom, come at it with their teeth and their fighting and their nailed claws, like just coming at it like aggressively. And there is a place for that. Sometimes we need that. Women, much like the female animals, you know, are more nurturing, you know, the lion licking her cub and the elephant mom putting her trunk around her calf. Like, there's, a, there's, a, there's a coming together that women do organically. We seem to like to look for the compromise to find the win-win, which doesn't always work, but it has to at least be tried. And I think that that's the magic of bringing men and women together and bringing women up into higher positions in conservation where they really have a true voice and then it's not, not a vanity credit, so to speak. That's, that's what we need to end this, right? Yes. Because, because those two forces together, mm-hmm. undeniable. You know, that's where you see change. In my opinion. Yes. In my humble beautifully opinion. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. It is very much a yin-yang because there are you know, a thousand different aspects that these issues always have to be tackled at. And I think it's like you said, men <laughs> have certain skills and women, and women also have certain abilities. And those two together are unstoppable. And, you know, we have seen that in how everybody works. Um, now, everybody, we're getting get a little close to wrapping up. So I just want to say if you have any questions for Carrie, please put them in the comments. I just yeah. want to say hi to Sherry. Camilla said there's some absolutely amazing women making a difference, just as there are men. It's just about working together, which is what you were talking about, Carrie, which I really love. You know, um, it's like we talk about here on the conservation conversation. Having a conversation is important because we are a giant encyclopedia set. You know, we all have experiences and we all have knowledge. And the more we have conversations, the more we share that knowledge. And the further that can spread and those seeds of knowledge can grow and grow and we can learn to educate our each other and educate ourselves throughout the, the Internet mm-hmm. era. And that's another thing I love about your film is that you're bringing a new perspective and a new conversation mm-hmm. to a very 
ongoing dialogue and it's very important it's very fresh and it's and it's exactly what's needed right now um scott wilson says a day without learning is a day without truly living blessings to you both and you know i do love Carrie, that you always use your opportunities when you're doing your press to just educate people on what's happening and how they can help not only the villagers, but the people that are fighting uh, the poaching as well, because it's such a complex human issue. Um, now, everybody, if you would like to go ahead and pop some questions mm -hmm. up, I can pose those to Carrie before we end. But Carrie, I know you said you had an important announcement or an exciting announcement that you wanted to make for us here on the podcast. So please uh, go ahead. I'm excited. Breaking news. Yes. <laughs> so it's exclusive. Yeah. Um, so we've been playing film festivals and we've been so lucky. We've won, um, well, as of last night, we won another one. We won the Platinum uh, Award at the Houston World Fest International Film Festival, which is the world's oldest film festival. Congratulations. Fantastic. So their 53rd year. So we were just blown away in all of this news of the coronavirus and doom and gloom. <laughs> We got an email that we won, so that was it's so exciting. Thank Fantastic. you. Well, that, our great. team were, were just glowing. Um, but we get so many comments of like, you know, I'm not at that film mm -hmm. festival. How can I see your film? So you know, as a filmmaker, it's all about distribution. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. I have some very indulgent <laughs> investors. And, you know, we were about to start the distribution process right when this whole quarantining mm -hmm. thing started. But I had a conversation with them saying, our film literally shows you how a pangolin finds its way into the wet market for the layperson to understand what this problem is. For us to sit on it in this situation, is, it's almost a crime. I said, what if we did a sneak peek, just like two nights only of screening the film, pay-per-view, um, and it's a sneak peek, it's not full distribution. And they said, yes, they'll do it. So what we're offering is... Um, it's a sneak peek on two separate days, May the 9th and May the 14th. Uh, it's a rental only, so you can rent it for a 24-hour period. And each rental comes with a What of Africa, which is a $60 value. And I have not got the link to share with you yet, but it's going to definitely be on May the 9th, and, and it'll be under screenings and breakingtheirsilence.com slash screenings for all the information when we have it. And then we'll blast it all over social media. But where they, they allowed me to do it, which is, you know, it's a big, it's a big um, risk for them that, mm -hmm. you know, we may not get distribution because of it, but they understood too that this is more important that we share it with the world right now and, and let them see these men and women who are in the film, it's not men, and, and see what's actually going on in it. Because you'll have more in the Understanding of like why are we all self-quarantined right now? We're, I don't understand it. The film will help you see how it all happens. It, it's a part of the journey, but at least you'll have some kind of context of why we're all self-quarantining right now. That is exciting. That is great. Thank you for sharing that with everybody. Uh, as you guys just heard, there because I've been the same way. I've been watching you get all the awards, and I thought I got to make a festival to see this film and just waiting for distribution <laughs> and awaiting because you know if you guys uh weren't able to hear that carrie is actually bypassing the standard um distribution route <laughs> and saying I, you know it doesn't even matter the information needs to get out there i'm putting it online you can rent it and it actually may it's an un it's an unknown path you know it, it whether it hurts your distribution or not i love that you don't really care about that aspect. You just want to make sure people get educated, people learn. And like you said, what is happening there is exactly on the grounds and it relates perfectly to this coronavirus right now and the time that we're facing because of all the neglect and all the destruction we've done to our natural world. The world has bitten us back for a little bit. So, you know what? While we're at home is the perfect time for us to start re-educating ourselves and learn about it. So, very exciting. And we will put the link up as soon as you have it. And I will make sure that, you know, we, we get everybody to know about that. So, that's that's super exciting. I can't wait to see it, too. Okay. Great. And let's see. Thank you. Um, yeah, Thank I'm, you. I'm just, I'm so glad this film yeah, is gaining so much momentum. Because the other challenge is... When you make a conservation documentary, most people don't know this because most people watch National Geographic. And like you said, they do their thing. They're very good at it, but it's a different formula. You tried to really get into the nitty into the front line, take your camera that had, where it hasn't been before and show people the true scope of this story from beginning to end. 
And I think that, you know, what people don't know is that it's almost for much for most of us almost impossible to sell a conservation agenda or to sell a conservation story that's not super rough and tumble and it's, it's a difficult industry as is so um you know i love that you're brave in the face of that and have decided to just make sure that everybody gets it regardless because it's you know it's a challenge always for conservation films to find homes and to find distribution um so i think you sharing it is that's revolutionary in its own you probably don't realize that you're very humble you don't take too much credit for all the innovation that you do and all the work that you're doing so thank you so it much is. because you're changing the game as you're as you're going through it. It makes all the difference. Uh, Vicky says, "Thank you, Carrie." Yes, too uh, kind. <laughs> yeah, you're you're one of my inspirations, Carrie, and I'm very excited to have you here. So. And you are too. I started your documentary. Oh, it's okay, amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you. <laughs> Perfect. Well, you know, uh, I'm excited. We're going to have some distribution going on by the end of the year, and hopefully, I can help add to like i said this uh this bigger dialogue you know <laughs> add a new conversation in. <laughs> um sherry says plant the seed and nourish it it will grow uh vic shabra is watching hey vic um you well. Vic is exactly always well. doing uh, conservation work and is a big water activist down in florida and is always here with us um Gary says, hey. uh, oh sherry also says hashtag women warriors and I love that, you know, because this is exactly what we're talking about. You know, this is what we need um, more balance in the perspectives, more balance in the voices that are being heard. And Carrie, you have, like I said, really brought a new story out and changed everything. So as a conservationist, I thank you. And I want to thank you for being on today. Um, it looks like people are all saying thank you very much. Um, they don't seem to have too many questions. Coralie does say thank you, Carrie. And Coralie is uh, a friend of mine that I met. Thank you. Uh, traveling with Captain Pete. And Coralie did a lot with uh, with us on there and is always very active. So I know she's oh. And she's, uh, yeah, she's fantastic activist. Pete's got six degrees. See, exactly. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> Well, Carrie, I wanted to thank you so much for being on the show today and ha and hanging in there thank through all you. these little tech issues as well. <laughs> to uh, to it's fine, it's fine. Perfect. Thanks for having me on, Eric. Oh, it's it's a real pleasure, and your story is fantastic. The interview was was wonderful, and you gave us so much to think about today. Thank you so much. Aw. Thanks. Bye. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. All right, everybody. That was Carrie David, one of the most incredible conservation filmmakers that I know and with talking about her new film breaking their silence but not giving the standard interview but actually talking to us a little bit more about how all of us can fit in and make a change and Carrie brought up these great points that no matter what your specialty is conservation can use your help so if you want to help you can do everything from helping pass on information on social media to working with an NGO, to volunteering your time, maybe starting an NGO when you find that there's something missing there. A lot of us accidentally stumble into our, you know, our, our corners that we end up finding. So it's a very important thing that we all keep searching. And then we all remember that, you know, as I always say, as much as we are part of the problem, we are the solution just the same. So as Carrie was saying, all of us can get together, male, female, your local people, international people, we have access to everybody now. And the more we can all get together, the more that we can change how nature, the environment and the animals are treated. And all of us have a way to do that. And, uh, you know, some of us make films like Carrie and I do, you know, we, we hope that we can be flashlights in the dark and bring in some new information that can then get conversations going on local levels. They always say that a great film ends after the credits start. I mean, the great film begins after credits start. So I do think that um, Carrie has exactly one of those kind of films where when you walk out of it, you will take all the information you just saw and your soul will chew on it for a few days and you will be moved and you will be 
um, brought to action, you know, and that's what I love is when you see these people that uh, go out there and do these, it just calls you to action. So, um, you know, it's really important. Oh, and Vic did have a question. What's Carrie's next project? Sorry, Vic, I got that too late after Carrie had already signed off with us, but you can go to Carrie's website and check out her new project. Uh, and her actually the, um, let's see, I put it there in the, let's see, in the, um, should be in the links below, but you can easily go to kdcfilms.com. Carrie is very modest. She wouldn't, she never promotes herself, but let me tell you, for somebody to say, I'm just going to go tell this story on the front lines of the poaching war, you're talking about somebody going to a very foreign area in a totally different way of living in incredibly difficult conditions. These conditions are so difficult that trained rangers have a hard time surviving. So, you know, like Carrie said, they had to really prove themselves. And for somebody to have the passion to say, I'm going to take cameras over there. Listen, when you take cameras over there and there's gunshots and battles, and even if you're just out in the field, you are a walking target. People know about you. Carrie put it all on the line to go tell this story and to bring the story back to us. And she just, it's like tennis. She just, you know, clicked it. The ball's back in our court now. So it's a fantastic film. And again, she announced just here on the show that she's going to be doing um, ahead of screening. So I'm very excited for that. Everybody is very, very, I, I can't wait. Uh, and we will keep you updated because um, again, I'm a very big Big fan of this documentary, big fan of Carrie's work. I will make sure that you have the necessary links needed to go see that film when it's available online. Um, so yeah, Vic, like I was saying, if you go to Carrie's uh, kdcfilms.com, you can check out her new project and she does have a new project she's working on right now. Um, but I probably couldn't pitch it nearly as interestingly as her website could. So I encourage everybody to go to her website or you can go to breakingtheirsilence.com and from there you can click into how you can help out and that can take you to above, over to Above Africa, her, uh, her nonprofit that she also works with and beautiful stories there as well. Uh, Dirk says, hey, hey Dirk, I'm, by the way, glad to have you on the show. Uh, Dirk says, so good to hear and see good people doing real good things. Thank you, Carrie and Eric. And, um, you know, I want to quote one of Dirk's lyrics right now. Evil flourishes when good men do nothing. So good men, good women, we are all it's all it's all on us. We are behooved to go out there and do what we can do, because otherwise evil will flourish. And that is very true. Uh, Sherry. Yeah, she is an amazing lady. Absolutely. Uh, please go check out her website. I can't encourage people enough. Um, and Coralie, it's nice to see you on here. Vicky, you as well. And uh, yeah, it's nice to see everybody. Uh, I do apologize for all of our tech issues today. Thanks everybody for, for joining in. Um, you know, this is always my favorite part of the week. I know it's been a little inconsistent. As most of you know, I'm uh, taking some radiation treatments right now <clears throat> for my cancer. So sometimes it does um, interfere with my ability to keep the show on. But I am going to be bringing it to you every week. And I also have a very interesting uh, thing that I would like to announce. I don't know, uh, Vic, if I'm allowed to talk too much about it. But starting on Earth Day, we're going to be launching Peace, Peace Vision. And I'm not part of the company that's launching it, but I am one of the filmmakers that's going to be working with Peace Vision to bring you some very unique content in a time of turmoil. Um, so Peace Vision, uh, and that launches on Earth Day. So hopefully everybody has some great Earth Day plans. I know this year is a little bit uh, odd. You know, I was thinking about maybe just having an informal show and let's all just get together and talk on Earth Day, see what's happening. Let's report around from where we are. Let's talk about our local issues. Maybe we'll just have a, a quick chat, everybody, uh, on Earth Day. I would love that and find out what's happening in your part of the town. What issues are you concerned with? And, you know, the, they're being drowned out a lot by coronavirus. You know, a lot of people have a lot of concerns. There's a lot of economical issues right now. People are suffering in many different levels in many different ways right now. And it's a very difficult time. The earth and the animals still need us. And we need to make sure we bring that conversation back. 
um, because even though we are going through coronavirus and we are all going a little nutties in our home, everybody's here, it's actually the perfect time for us to spend with our online community and our online friends. And luckily, you know, we have conservationists around the world. And that's why I love this show, because we get conservationist perspectives from everywhere. So I just wanted to join everybody. I just wanted to thank everybody for joining me today on this very special episode with Carrie. And we are going to go ahead and, like I said, we'll get those links for her screenings coming up. And please join me on Earth Day for a, uh, I guess we'll just call it a roundtable. Why don't we get together and talk about some of the issues that we're facing, some of the issues that we can learn how to solve together, because that's the key. Just like Carrie said, um, you know, we can bring all these perspectives together and move forward together for a better future. And so I thank Carrie for being out in the field and risking her life and risking all of the time and stress and everything. And even though she went out to shoot the film, there's no, like I said, there's no ever guaranteed distribution for us conservationists. So she went out doing it as an act of love, knowing that she'd be able to bring it to an audience somehow. And even though she's still in that process, she's bypassing it because she wants everybody to see this film and understand that everybody can help. You know, you don't have to be a superstar. You don't have to be the ranger out. Uh, you don't have to be, um, you know, this image of this wild in the field person. I, I've done it quite a bit myself. Uh, I've gone out in the fields and definitely done some crazy stuff. But, you know, it doesn't matter. Sometimes sharing information on social media, media can have just the same impact. And all of us are needed. All of us play our part. All of us have our job. And all of us together can change things because we have to remember we are all connected. And please, if you're going to take anything out of the coronavirus, just think that we have this great opportunity because we've had this shared experience, cultural experience together. And, you know, as we've talked about before, we used to have lost our shared cultural experiences when the Internet became very prevalent. Those that are my age, I'm 47. When you think back, everybody remembers certain events, whether it was an Olympic event or uh, a TV event or a movie event or something like that. We all remembered and we all had the same cultural experience that has disappeared. Things have become more individualized and isolated and we've forgotten how to, to talk in, to each other in a lot of fashions. So now we have had this shared cultural experience and everybody around the world realizes that unless we all clean up our own backyards, you know, Carrie made it a good point that we needed to understand what's happening in China. We don't want to just vilify people for what's happening. There are activists in Vietnam, China and other places that are fighting this just as hard as we are. And if everybody, you know, that's also noticing the coronavirus, please remember that we have over 80 wet markets in New York City alone. Uh, when I was in wet markets in Vietnam, one of the main foods was frogs. Uh, you can buy these frogs all around the USA, too, and they're alive and they will cut them for you live when you buy them. Um, and I did not want to put video of it on today because I don't really want to gross everybody out. Um, but let me just tell you, it's something you never forget in a wet market is a very different experience. Uh, I've seen bushmeat in many markets and it's very disturbing also. Um, so these are the things, but they're happening here in America. They're happening in the UK. They're happening in Germany. They're happening in Africa. They're happening in China, Vietnam. They are happening everywhere because people are living in abject poverty and we have to find a way to give those people alternatives. And as Carrie said, there's that beautiful model that she discovered over there. And now people are using it and over 13 villages are using that model and understanding that there's more money in ecotourism than in death, which makes me happy. And I'm sure it brings a smile to everyone else's face. So uh, I just wanted to thank everybody for being here today. Everybody. Uh, hey, Reed. Wow. Good to see you, man. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen Reed for a while. Reed, are you back here in the States? Reed and I were out on some adventures overseas as well. Um, I'm Michelle. Nice to see you. And uh, Michelle, I hope you're staying safe and everybody's staying safe out there, whether you work in the medical field 
or you're just at home. I hope everybody's safe, healthy, happy, and just keeping their spirits up. And you know, hey, if anybody's feeling isolated at any point, please reach out, send me an email, hit me up on Facebook, call me on Skype, um, call me anything. Just don't, please don't be uh, isolated, okay? We, we have to remember to keep this together and we have to find these great solutions because if we can talk to more conservationists around the world about international problems that are in all of our backyards, we can find ways once we move out of the coronavirus with this cultural shared experience to really, truly, honestly address for the first time the international wildlife market, whether it's a wet market, it's a rhino market, it's an ivory market, the international wildlife market itself, whether we're talking about live exports also, these things are all happening. They're all contributing to the environmental factors that we have here. Hey, Sam, thanks for being on today, man. It's good to see, um, it's good to see your name up there. Uh, yeah, another friend uh, from way back in the day. So, um, guys, I just want to uh, say hi to everybody. Uh, Molly says, yeah, you should be able to go surfing soon again. Yeah, you know, I'm hoping that um, soon this will be under control and I'll be able to get back out there. I'm looking forward to it. I know we all miss nature. I mean, look, we're all here. We all love nature. We're all conservationists on this show. So, you know, I know all of us uh, are itching inside to get back out and, and be amongst our nature. So thanks, Carrie. Yes, definitely stay safe. And, um, you know, for those of you that are out in the country, I know you're, you know, you're able to social distance a lot better. And, um, you know, I'm just glad to hear everybody's doing okay. So thanks again, everybody, for joining. And it was a fantastic show today. I really enjoyed having Carrie David on. She is somebody that is changing the way documentaries are done and the way we look at conservation. And that is so innovative and so needed. And she's reinvigorating the industry. And uh, she's fantastic. And also a good friend of mine and just one of my inspirations. So today was a very special show for me. And... Uh, Yes, yeah, Sam. Thank you. Good. Good to see you on here, too. Um, I think you're if I remember correctly, you're on the East Coast. So I hope everybody, um, you know, around the world is is doing OK. So thanks again for being on the conservation conversation. I appreciate everybody joining in today, talking to us, uh, being being on the show. And like I said, going through all the technical issues. So I will see everybody on Earth Day. Excuse me for our next episode. And we'll talk about backyards. What's going on in your backyard? So remember, it's our world. Let's talk about it. All right, everybody.